Is it this working? Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this session of the International Journalism Festival. Uh, it's uh, supported by the European Cultural Foundation, and it's about the Newborn Council for European Public Space, but also two other uh, very significant uh, initiatives, a European Perspective and Display EU. Uh, it's uh, a very crucial moment to talk about these uh, initiatives because uh, we are reaching uh, a crisis point when it comes to reliability, accountability of the sources of news. We all know how um, the availability of content and the speed at which it spread has created a huge problem in terms of um, post truth facts, fake news, uh, and so on. This is bound to accelerate with artificial intelligence, so we have not seen anything yet, and we're starting to actually see things uh, with the AI-generated images. You might have seen uh, the image of the Pope with that lovely white puffy jacket. Did you believe it? You know, you used to say, I believe only what I see, but we're entering a stage in which we can't believe what we see. So the onus are on societies, on governments, but on citizens as well. How are we going to be able to distinguish uh, truth from um, false news? The latest polls are not very encouraging. I've got here some uh, polls by Ipsos Morris that say that um, actually when you ask the general public almost everywhere in the world, they think that 65% uh, 65%, 65 think that are the others who live in a bubble. Only 34% admit that they do. And 58% think that they are much better than the others at spotting fake news. But only 28% admit that actually they don't have any clue. And of course, uh, fake news uh, matter, disinformation matter for our democracies and for our um, safety. So we know that the role that this information has had in um, Brexit or in the election of Trump has been uh, significant. But we also know that uh, during the COVID pandemic, this information has killed people. Still, a lot of people believe uh, in conspiracy theories about uh, what happened uh, with the pandemic. And so what do we do? Uh, time has come to try to take this uh, seriously. And um, we have uh, four very important panelists here. Let me introduce them uh, to you. So we have Paul Nemitz um, at my left, principal advisor of DG Justice at the European Commission. Matthias Pfaffer, who is the um, founding director of the Council for European Public Space. We have uh, Justina Kurtzabinska, who is a senior editor of news uh, and strategy development uh, at EBU, and Alexander Baratsitz, who is the director of the Cultural Broadcast Archive in Vienna, and is also currently the director of uh, Display. So we have these uh, three initiatives. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about them uh, in details. But first, I would like to give the floor to Paul, who somehow represents the European Commission here and can help us understand a little bit better if the European Commission is aware of the seriousness of the situation and how seriously is taken the problem of uh, democracy and uh, trustworthy media. Thank you very much uh, for the possibility to say a few words here. Um, of course, the European Commission is very worried about the rule of law situation in Europe and also about uh, the development of democracy, the shrinking space for civil society, governments putting their hand on media, 
or for that matter tycoons putting their hand on media. The European integration started as an economic project, but we are now learning that we have to do much more uh, for fundamental rights, rule of law and democracy. And you can track this um, in the policy development of the European level. We have now a democracy action plan. We have legislative proposals which have already passed, which put, let's say, some guardrails on the power of platforms and introduce a certain degree of accountability of the platforms to fight fake news. Um, we also invest in terms of uh, political investment in legislation to protect the freedom of the media, to protect journalists against um, uh, unfounded uh, litigation. And finally, um, we also put out a lot more funds to support the free press and uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here and also to listen a little bit to uh, these uh, presentations of these new uh, projects. One thing is clear, we need in Europe all hands on deck for democracy. We need engagement for democracy and um, I would say those who work in the journalistic space, in the media space, are the first ones to be called upon um, to join this effort and also to seek new forms um, of uh, cooperation in light of uh, also the great economic difficulties uh, which uh, media face, uh, in particular, of course, through the competition uh, with the two big platforms, Facebook and Google, which cash in 80% of all new advertising uh, revenue on the Internet, uh, which previously was available to finance the private press but also because public media, publicly financed media, and in particular public TV, is very much under pressure in the member states, in some member states under direct pressure of governments who have put their hand on public TV, in other member states through, I would say, a very untimely discussion about the legitimacy, uh, you know, big political uh, parties questioning uh, the need for public service TV, I think all this requires a new alliance for democracy and the readiness to go beyond, uh, let's say, old patterns of preserving your own turf, but to open up. I think it's important to open up and seek new alliances for a good functioning democratic public space in Europe and to strengthen and reinvigorate democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, Matthias, uh, it's um, 61 years since uh, Jürgen Habermas coined this uh, fundamental concept uh, of the public sphere of a society. Uh, you have just created uh, the European Council for a Public Sphere, so it's a, it's a big mission. Let's uh, remind what the public sphere was for uh, Habermas. The public sphere is the arena where citizens come together, exchange opinion regarding public affairs, discuss, deliberate, form of public opinion. Obviously, when this doesn't happen anymore in the current uh, scenario, one of the first consequences of uh, what we are seeing is that societies do not have a public arena anymore in which they come together. We have a polarization of uh, people uh, living in their bubbles and believing what they want to believe in uh, those bubbles. We've just seen the data. They think that the others are in the bubble. So why your project is important, why it matters, and how do you think you can make it work? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Annalisa. Um, and I can say, yes, we are driven by these ideas of um, um, philosophers like Jürgen Habermas, but not only, but also by the experiences that we all have and that you described in Paul as well. And I'm very happy to hear that the politician uh, actors are very much aware of the situation that we all live in. Um, why is the public sphere so important for democracy? It's not only um, um, a kind of industry what the media does, but it's the precondition for autonomy, 
and for a free choice, which is basic for a democracy. If you are not informed, you cannot make a free choice. If you are informed by um, sources that you can't trust, you lose trust into all the institutions, you lose trust in democracy, um, and a democracy will fail. So uh, that's really a tremendous uh, moment in history because it's a revolution which is not um, happening on the streets or with tanks or with guns, but it's happening with algorithms and through platforms. And um, I think uh, when you look what happened now in the last month with GPT and the other uh, tools, large language models, you know, this is uh, the beginning of something very new and we all have to be very much aware of that because there are serious studies that um, into five years we do have like 80 or 90 percent of the content on the web. It will be created synthetically, which means by algorithms. So <clears throat> whom do we believe in the future? Um, we have to ask these questions. We have to ask uh, what is uh, this technology doing to democracy and autonomy uh, and to humans in general? And uh, we decided, we, that's a group of uh, concerned uh, citizens uh, to found another council to discuss these questions, the Council for uh, European Public Space uh, will be set up in June in Amsterdam. Um, I'm now the funding and also looking out for uh, funding director and founding director both. Um, and um, I'm happy to uh, present in June um, a, a very good team of, of people who take care of these questions in the area of politics. But we don't want to be only a think tank, another think tank, but we also want to be a do tank. Because, as I said, the situation is really traumatic and uh, we have to act. We have to act now for platforms. We have to reclaim democracy, reclaim public spaces which are occupied by, by uh, widely active uh, platforms and business models which are not uh, um, supporting democracy but undermining it. And um, we ask the question, not only of bubbles that you mentioned um, that are uh, uh, created by such of these, um, of these information systems uh, in the way we usually talk about them, but we do have still in Europe, and that's another uh, problem, we only have national bubbles in terms of national public spheres. And this was always one problem for the unification process in Europe, because uh, as Habermas found out and stated very clearly, you can only have a democracy that is working if you do have a common public sphere where everyone has access to the same kind of proven fact-based information, uh, can build up own op opinions and where, um, where, where people can connect and can decide and make decisions. Um, we, do, we don't, uh, don't have this public sphere, this unified public sphere in Europe. The argument was always because of language and cultural barriers. But now we live in a time, first time in history, where, where technology can help us and enable us. And there are no barriers anymore for artificial intelligence programmed um, 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 language tools. Uh, it's, it's obvious that we can do, uh, uh, even now, today, already real-time translation in all 24 official languages of Europe. So we could enable European citizens to see directly what their neighbors are being informed with or what they are discussing. And that would be a big, huge progress for Europe in two ways. Firstly, to build up first time a common European public sphere where the public spheres are opened among each other and mutual to each other. Um, secondly, it would help us by building such a technology, which is not uh, so uh, simple as I said, but uh, it takes a lot of development and a lot of investment to, to really develop democratic um, uh, algorithms, so to say. So that means algorithms that don't lead you into bubbles by recommendations, but that inspire you and translation tools who also serve the smaller communities of speakers in Europe, which is uh, one of the core elements of Europe, that we do have a broad variety of languages and of cultures. <clears throat> and being here in this beautiful Italian place, um, it comes to my mind that uh, Italian intellectual Umberto Eco once said, 
uh, what is the language of, of Europe? Um, he was asked and he said, the language of Europe is translation. And now we do have a very, very powerful and mighty translation tool which enables, as I said it already, speech to text and text to speech by technology to uh, translate in every language. And why don't we build a European public sphere by using this technology and developing it uh, by values which we all in Europe uh, uh, like and which are not presented by American or Chinese uh, companies to us. So this is the idea. We're reaching out for uh, more support, for more members to support us in different uh, member states of the European Union. We are looking out, maybe opening up some offices and we try to help the uh, political actors uh, to uh, get even closer to that path that Paul already described, to invest more in safeguarding democracy. Okay. We're going to thank you, Matthias. We're going to talk more in details about uh, Display EU, which is uh, one of the projects we are talking about today. <coughs> Matthias just uh, mentioned it, but we're going to go in more details uh, in a minute. Uh, and the one key is uh, the capacity, the ability to translate simultaneously uh, the languages. But let me get to Justina, because uh, uh, Justina is in a very key position in Europe because uh, she works at EBU, the European Broadcasting uh, Union, so it's the union of all public services uh, in Europe. She's senior editor of News there, and she's been working uh, on an interesting uh, project, European uh, Perspectives, that is very dear particularly to me because um, I started my career as a journalist uh, as uh, part of the founding member team of um, Euronews, the first attempt of creating a, a European public sphere by sharing uh, news. That was 1993, the date of birth of the European Union, with the birth of the Treaty of Maastricht, which established the European Union. At the time, in 1993, the biggest challenge was languages. We had to make uh, six different uh, ling linguistic versions, and it was extremely cumbersome. So one of the reasons uh, why they say this European public sphere has never really taken off is uh, languages. <laughs> but it's not entirely true because certainly in the case of Euronews, which was born as a project of different public service broadcasters, what happened was that as soon as it was born, the founding members, instead of really collaborating and cooperating, they started competing. Quelle surprise, that's an old story in Europe. Uh, we try to do things together and then uh, somehow national interest uh, take over. So certainly in my mind, I was there. Uh, what was the main problem with that project was that there was never really a sincere uh, desire from the national broadcasters to make it work. And in fact, soon after its birth, and it was quite a visionary project in 1993, um, national broadcasters started their own uh, national news channels, uh, France 24 uh, in France, in Italy, Rai News 24, in Germany, the several other news channels, that they were all competing with their own creature. So that was difficult. But Justine is there now at EBU, so the Association of European Broadcasters. She's been working on an interesting uh, sharing of content between broadcasters, which would be very, very key to strengthen a European public sphere and a European perspective. Do you want to show, to tell us something about the project? And then she has a video to show us. Thank you All very right. much. Um, so, um, yes, uh, indeed, I think what is very important to mention, and Paul mentioned already that public service media is under a lot of uh, pressure, either political but also financial. Therefore, innovation is not uh, an easy task. But um, uh, three years ago, uh, we started thinking how could we 
change the sharing of news between public service media, uh, which are part of the uh, European Broadcasting Union, uh, in online environment. European Broadcasting Union has been running a news content exchange, B2B, between the broadcasters for 60 years. And as you mentioned, I think until now we had a very strong uh, national perspective and national remit. But with things that are going on around us, between which started really, our project started exactly uh, during COVID time. And I was very happy to present the first results last year. But since then, we have war in Ukraine. We are all struggling with inflation, with energy prices. I mean, all the stories, including the climate, uh, climate change, are stories which are not happening in particular countries. So we said, OK, so how can we share content in the online environment between uh, public service media broadcasters? And this is how the project started. So uh, I could talk for a long time, but I think that it would be good if I show you first uh, a little video explaining the project, and then I go just to a few more details. So if we could now um, switch the, could we switch the video, the, in, the internet? No, no, this is not the one. Uh, just the internet page that I'm displaying on my computer. Because now we are seeing just the uh, slides. Is it possible? Uh, is it possible just to show my screen? Uh, no, this is not my screen. Maybe. Okay, if it's uh, is a problem. Maybe okay. we'll, do, we'll do without. Um, yeah, we can we can do without. But I think that we would like to show you what it looks like um, looks like in reality. It would be much better if we could. Uh, if not, we will um, um, we will uh, just show the slides. If we can just have the page uh, the the page that I see on my screen. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, sorry about this. But the sound. Yeah. <laughs> sound, you have to make We it. tested the sound, but it uh, seems like we're not technically very lucky. It's a technical to project. independent, trusted news. Every second of every day. And now, they're driving a unique editorial and technical collaboration. A European perspective. Harnessing the scale and power of EBU members. A European perspective brings online audiences the best journalism in their own languages. Together, we're throwing light on the issues affecting all European citizens and putting our own journalism into perspective by seeing how those issues are reported elsewhere. In a world of information overload and language barriers, each editor recommends their best stories to their counterparts in other countries. This is made possible by a state-of-the-art software platform using the latest machine learning. It's powered by Peach, the EBU's personalization and recommendation system, and Eurovox for transcribing, translating, revoicing, and subtitling multilingual content. Text, video, and audio news, all translated into several different languages. A European perspective is embedded directly into members' own websites. It will enable us to build a culture of mutual understanding, helping to inform the public by guiding them to trusted news sources and countering disinformation. So I think you get an idea of what it looks like, and I think it's very interesting to see how it works. So in a way, the concept is that the stories can travel across the countries. So here uh, you can see a little visualization which really shows the public, the, it shows the platform effect and how the stories can travel to different countries. So you can see that the stories, for example, from RTBF, which is on the left, 1,126 stories traveled across Europe over time. And for example, uh, they were republished uh, by um, RTE, which is in Ireland, 
or for example the stories from um, uh, from uh, oh you can see all the publishers from RTBF so you can see art republished uh, 551 stories uh, from RTBF uh, BR in Germany 1,000 stories so you can see how it how it really works uh, how how you can create a real value. So the investment in public service media, in a way, it's reinforced now with stories traveling across Europe. And I will show you what it looks like in reality. So let's take a look at the European perspective. We are now on the uh, Irish um, uh, website of RTE, Public Service Broadcaster, and you can see uh, a European perspective, stories coming from, uh, from different broadcasters. You can see uh, the flag and the logo also of the originated broadcaster. Of course, uh, the stories are translated into English uh, thanks to the um, application that you have seen, thanks to the tool, the Eurovox. So I can read, for example, about um, a story that was trending um, in different countries. Yesterday was a story from, for example, France Info. Uh, about a French retailer, Carrefour, who, which announces menstrual leave for affected employees. And then let's take a look at France Info. Uh, so this is the website of uh, France Television. And you, I'm sure you all heard the story, um, which was also trending um, two days ago, uh, especially those who work in the media. So the Swedish radio, uh, which is uh, one of the most trusted um, public service media broadcasters in Europe, decided to leave, uh, to leave Twitter um, uh, and we had the, the audio story. You can see that um, the audience, um, uh, audience can see or listen even to the story if there is a video and the story comes with the natural language and it can be also transcribed into the destination language. So what you're seeing is the actual out output of uh, France Info. And um, so basically the concept is that one of the stories, let's say like the French retailer Carrefour, can uh, travel from France en Fort to maybe nine countries and be translated into even 10 languages because some of the broadcasters uh, have outputs in several languages. Uh, for example, Swiss Info, which is a public uh, service online output for Switzerland, publishes their stories in 10 different languages. So this is really the concept, uh, the concept of, this, um, of this project. And if I can show you one more thing is, um, I hope, okay, now we are on it. So this is a very good example. This is a story from Spain about retirement age. Uh, the French uh, citizens know how exciting this topic can be, or heated, I would say, maybe not exciting. And this story uh, from Spain, it was about at which, uh, what age people retire in different countries and how much money they earn, what's the average um, uh, retirement income. You can see that this story from Spain was republished in nine different box boxes in seven countries. So again, this is about traveling. Now, um, okay, this is the concept, this was the concept that we developed together with public service media broadcasters, but do audience, uh, is audience interested? Does audience need it? It is interested because we can see, of course, that uh, these stories are being read. Uh, we are monitoring it. But what we did as well, this was at the end of the first phase of the project. We did a survey in uh, the four countries that you can see here. And even in France, uh, which was expected to be a little bit more skeptical, uh, as you can see, uh, the results um, uh, when people were asked whether they would be interested in reading stories from other countries was not bad, was 52%. And I just received yesterday from my colleague, I don't have a beautiful presentation yet, but we uh, did a research now in another four countries and uh, we have also uh, quite similar results. So uh, it looks like the audiences across Europe are very, very interested in getting news from, uh, from other countries. It will vary depending on the countries, but I think that there is, um, this brings me to conclude that there is definitely a case for a broader uh, public space and for, for knowledge and sharing the culture and sharing the, the European uh, news and culture more broadly.
Th thank you, Justine. Uh, uh, well, this data is very encouraging and it's brilliant that uh, you are advancing like this, but um, it looks still like quite niche. And the fact that it is uh, B2B, so it's between broadcasters, uh, the kind of exchange. Okay, so maybe I wasn't very clear. So what you're saying now is not B2B, this is B2C. Uh, okay. uh, behind this is uh, this is the this is what you can see uh, on the public service online outputs of currently 16 public service media broadcasters. What you're seeing is the homepage of uh, RTE, and this is the homepage of France Info. So this is on the front page of uh, seven of 16 public service media today. Sometimes uh, it's not just a box. Sometimes these stories are also incorporated or collaborated on um, with journalists participating in this pan-European network newsroom. What is behind it is a B2B tool, uh, and I will just give you a glimpse. In this tool, we have actually 30 sources, and here, um, here you have over 20 languages, and this is the B2B tool, which is our media asset management, to produce uh, the European perspective that you have seen. This is where <laughs> journalists are selecting stories, where they are translating stories, and where they clear them for publishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is also another interface that reminds you of TweetDeck, I'm sure. So this is our public service media TweetDeck. Again, this part is B2B. And here, uh, journalists can uh, look for particular stories. Uh, they can look according to topics, according to languages. We translate automatically everything into English, uh, but it can be also translated into language that they desire. It can be, of course, filtered. And um, as you can see, uh, we can, in a, in a moment, uh, if I speak, for example, I'm originally Polish, I can choose Polish language and translate all these stories into Polish. So there are two dimensions. There is a B2B tool, this is the B2B one, and there is the public-facing uh, one that reaches directly audiences. I hope mm. that's a bit clearer now. So, thank you so much. Yes, that's much clearer, but I have one question for the future, because obviously one of the problems we have in terms of um, reaching out to the public, especially to younger audiences, is that they do not really watch uh, public service broadcasting anymore. They have completely switched off. You will find them on uh, TikTok or on other um, platforms. But uh, one possibility could be that if there was a kind of um, more awareness uh, of the difference between what you see on TikTok and what you see here as a trustworthy um, source, that could make it uh, really different. So in other words, if you are a kid that is on TikTok but knows that TikTok is uh, not reliable, but knows that if you go on a European perspective a website, then you will find this, the trustworthy sources. That, that could make a difference. Have you thought at ABU to make a kind of a more recognizable stamp of trustworthiness? I know that several printed media have been working on kind of a syndicate of making sure that people can recognize the authority of the source. And I was thinking, you know, in Europe we get trading standards and we see the little stamp of something that is respecting uh, things that you can buy and sell. Could we not have anybody talked about, you know, doing something that would actually brand the public service media information like a European perspective as trustworthy? So there's a lot of subjects you touched upon. Uh, so first of all, uh, what I showed you is the core of the project. Now these stories can be shared across social media platforms and actually in the second phase of the project, so this year, we are also on TikTok. So we started producing uh, with uh, members uh, specially purposed uh, TikTok uh, stories. You can follow us on TikTok on Europe and we have younger journalists, for example, uh, producing stories, very often explaining also uh, media literacy aspects. So you're right, uh, we, have to be, we have to try to be also where the audiences are, because uh, we know that not everybody goes to France Info or to uh, RTE website, though in many countries public service media have a very 
dedicated uh, readers um, and they are uh, in some countries top of online outputs. Um, in terms of branding, of course, the Euro European perspective, first of all, is branded as the public service media. It appears on the public service media outputs. Um, there are many different attempts to brand, uh, to brand trusted sources. But, uh, as, you pro as you know, probably, this also depends on the platforms. So, um, Elon Musk, as you know, caused a lot of a big outcry because he decided to, uh, to stamp and put his own stamp, uh, namely also on the public service media as public as state media. So, um, that depends on the platform. But there are many efforts and different initiatives uh, like the News Guards or Journalism Trust Initiative, which is a standardization uh, that has been introduced and I've had a pleasure to work on. So th this concept of trying to find a, a, a way to um, enable the audiences to identify trusted sources is something that the industry is striving with. Yes, we haven't, we haven't got one STEM for everybody yet that would be implemented, but that would be that would be an ideal, but there are different attempts, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that would be good. Let's go to Alexander, uh, because he is the director of the Newborn uh, Display EU, which is a very, very interesting project that also uh, has the hands of uh, Matthias uh, in its uh, genesis, in its birth. So, uh, display is uh, uh, a kind of development on European perspective. So, it's about the public service uh, media coming together with all this enormous content, which is paid by the taxpayer, and uh, is very often of very good quality, and try to find a way to redistribute it to a wider public in order to enhance uh, the kind of understanding of uh, other uh, perspective in Europe and also use this amazing uh, content. Can you tell us a, a bit more about really the core mission of Display EU? Yeah, thanks uh, for inviting me. Actually, there is no director of Display yet. Uh, I mean, we just received the grant from the European Commission. Thankfully, uh, it's a consortium of 15 um, civil society initiatives, so the core are on the one hand independent media, uh, especially from uh, independent uh, so far in Poland and Hungary, uh, there are no really reliable public service media and this is one of the main problems I see with the uh, uh, European perspective that uh, the partners are there in countries uh, where you have reliable sources and uh, you have some sort of uh, functioning media landscape, but uh, where in Europe uh, we have difficulties there. And I, I'm from Austria personally, and uh, we have here problems there as well. We are now facing the third right-wing government next year, possibly, and uh, here you have uh, then the public service broadcaster who is also <laughs> under threat of the government. And I'm thankfully to the European Commission that uh, 20 years ago, uh, the first time when the right-wing government take over, uh, I was uh, managing director of a radio station in that time, and uh, the first thing the government did, they cut our funds. And uh, we had headed then uh, to Brussels and talked to members of the parliament, they said, oh, this is uh, <laughs> sad to hear, but uh, unfortunately we cannot do anything about it because this is a national thing. Uh, and so uh, already in that time I understood, well, are we going to have to leverage this on another layer, on a European layer, because uh, in every other country we cannot uh, be, uh, say, uh, well, this is a national affair because it's a European affair. So this is maybe as an introduction, my personal uh, uh, story about that. Um, I'm part of a group that uh, mainly discussed the outcomes now of, of big tech uh, um, messing up with our media landscape in Europe. I mean, as Paul already mentioned, 80% of the income uh, formerly uh, get, got to news media uh, or the media uh, in general uh, now goes to two big tech platforms, and I mean, the, the outcome, <laughs> I mean, this is tremendous, and it, it will not halt. So our, our landscape is really uh, in, a, in a really crucial situation. And so we discussed, oh, what can we do about this in, in Europe? Uh, because we 
face another uh, a challenge that we have uh, this multitude of, of languages and how uh, to come about uh, this. Our answer to this is that we say regulation is not enough. Uh, GDPR is great and AI Act is great as well, but this won't be the solution to our uh, media landscape problem. We need to build up a European uh, technological infrastructure, which is owned by Europeans, which is run by Europeans, which is, has a democratic uh, a governance. So I mean, big tech, these are venture capitalists uh, with uh, Thiel and uh, guys behind that. Uh, they are no friends of democracy. And so we have to defend our democracies against that. And one pillar of it is we're going to need to build our own infrastructure. And so we sat together and uh, how could this uh, take place? I mean, we are just a group of freaks, uh, developers. Uh, how can this happen? Uh, with, I mean, now we we received 2.5 million, uh, and with that we're gonna build a minimum viable product where we gonna provide the core features on the one hand, the language tools, and um, so to overcome the language issue, and another pillar is um, we said uh, we <coughs> don't want to build a new central thing. Uh, we won't be able to compete anyway. But uh, the answer could be to network various existing platforms with their already existing audiences. So this could address, on the one hand, uh, also the language barrier, because they are in different language groups. And with our tool set, this could support to overcome uh, aspects. And uh, we can then, uh, so to say, share our audiences, which is in the media sphere, uh, which is uh, just uh, where competition is at the core. <laughs> a competition for audiences would be a completely uh, uh, shift of the complete comp of the mindset, and so. From, from from technology side, this is uh, the one pillar of the project. Um, while it is important to say uh, everything we're going to produce uh, or develop will be uh, put on the uh, open source. So uh, everybody who wants to join our network, and this will be open then for you everybody here. Uh, uh, I mean, there will be core values. Uh, it will be similar to Mastodon. You need to sign a net network covenant uh, to adhere to spe uh, certain values. But uh, if you adhere to it, and the most important is that you moderate your platform, then you can join our network and be part of uh, our group and make it bigger. And maybe just, mm -hmm. just to understand, because I'm getting a bit of vertigo here about what you're talking about. So what you're saying is that you can invite any content producer in Europe to be part of this uh, media platform, Display EU, which will have uh, tools to translate it automatically. And uh, the only thing that would be required would be uh, just a basic respect of fundamental values. Who is going to decide that? I mean, how, how uh, the governance, the editorial governance, how is it going to work? Well, uh, it won't wake work that way that uh, you have a sitting board there and an editorial board that looks through every each uh, each and every content so i'm from the cultural broadcasting archive we are we are a platform uh, a podcasting platform in austria and we have now 140,000 shows there uh, and uh, we have now a pace of 10,000 shows uh, approximately each year. I mean, this is nobody can look and listen to this. Uh, so this won't work. I mean, this doesn't make sense. So we actually are a host provider. And so if uh, something doesn't work, if there are complaints, then we could put the stuff off our platform. This is how it works. Can and you explain a little bit who the partners are? Who are these different partners from where the content comes now and who are running this project now with the 2 million euros? Who are they? The 15 partners now, one of the colleagues is here in the auditorium. Uh, it's, uh, Vox Europe is one of our main partners uh, in the editorial group. Uh, they are already uh, publishing in six different languages and have a specific uh, European approach to topics. 
Uh, Eurocene is another European network uh, that uh, also is, has a, a strong foothold in, in uh, European perspective uh, publishing. A Kritika Politichna, it's a Polish uh, outlet that has a strong network in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, these are the main editorial partners. Uh, then, for example, uh, Europe Talks, which is, is a, a special uh, initiative from the Deutsche uh, Die Zeit uh, to bring together uh, citizens uh, to discuss uh, specific topics. So there are also audience uh, uh, engagement uh, initiatives part of our group. And uh, yeah, there are also group develop. Uh, groups that um, develop the code. So this is uh, a bunch of, of people that are yeah, from France to uh, uh, via Spain, Italy to Poland. Okay, Alexander, uh, but there will be soon a website in which all this would be explained, I, ma I imagine, more clearly. Yeah? The official uh, soft launch will be in autumn. In the so, uh, uh, okay, so watch that space, display you. Okay, we're getting close to the end of our uh, workshop. I think that Justine wanted to add something quickly because then we, I would like to do another round and uh, bring yeah. things to a close. It's it's actually more for the for the closing, I guess. So um, I wanted to say that I think there are really a lot of positive signs. So. It's my pleasure that I was able to present to you, to you a European Perspective project, but we actually have a group of uh, different organizations where we're discussing similar initiatives. So to mention, for example, a European collection of Arte with other partners, which is longer format, uh, or Enter, which is a Deutsche Welle project also with partners uh, where content is produced for young audiences on, on social media. I think what we are seeing all is, because we are discussing with the partners, we are doing a lot of different initiatives, is to see how we can have you know, a more joint vision, how it can be more concentrated, and how these initiatives can become more powerful. So I think it's very good that they are starting. You know, there is a, a, lot, of, a lot of things going on. The European Commission um, support or the funding is of course important because it's not really easy today to fund innovation. Uh, but I think that um, a kind of longer term vision is really what's necessary. But the positive news is that there is a lot of Really Absolutely. Going on. Long term vision is the right word. But of course, if I may, I would like to bring Paul in because being someone who worked on the vision of the Commission at uh, Euronews uh, 34 years ago <laughs> and uh, nothing actually went according to plan, it's uh, very important to hear from you if you think that the Commission is realizing the urgency of the situation. Because uh, again, let me stress this, you know, we talk about the bad guys, the advertising revenues that goes to the Americans and so on. We talk all the time about that. But it is obvious that if the public sector, government, institutions are to do something, it will have to be publicly funded because you're never going to be able to compete with those giants. So it's the Commission and the government that needs to step in. Yes, but of course, uh, you know, I mean, the public TVs alone in Germany gets uh, 9.3 billion euros a year. So, you know, if that money is not enough to innovate, uh, you know, the European Commission will not be able to match that funding. I think also, honestly, I have to say on the EBU project, what I really don't like about it is the play out through the national stations. That means the editor in Poland will make sure that only play out takes place of stuff which the Polish government wants to see, and in Hungary only the content will be put out by the editor from your nice platform, which Mr. Orban likes. And that's not what is the progress for democracy in Europe? I think this tool is great. If you would make this tool available to all citizens to search their content from one portal, that would be progress. But as long as you do a completely intergovernmental, nationally oriented thing and give it into the hands of the national stations, of which we know that they are under the control of the government, this project is not going to help European democracy. So I would okay. like to see, to be very clear on this, I think it is very important that this type of technology now is opened up and that people can search themselves so that to make this practical, a Hungarian citizen 
can see news with your tool in Hungarian, which is produced in stations in France, in, in Sweden, in Finland, and not what the Hungarian Orban uh, installed editor is choosing, but what the citizen wants to see. And so that's what I like about uh, the projects presented on the other side of the table. They are open and they are not only B2B. Democracy in the end means getting the people informed, including in Europe, getting people out of the grip of a government which is not democratic anymore. You know, Hungary is not only the country where democracy and rule of law is most down the drain, it is also the country where people speak least foreign languages in all of Europe. And to help these people to get out of this grip, we need to work together more openly and with more partners. And I would also say, let's overcome fragmentation. Because the American platforms, their great strengths is, they are huge, they are completely unified. And we still operate in fragmented, you know, little silos where everybody protects their turf and so on. That's not going to work. I think in Europe, we need these two themes in the media space. One, give it to the citizen, open up. Second, overcome fragmentation. Thank you. I'm okay. sorry, I need to correct that because that's very important to the European Perspective Project. So EBU, European Broadcasting Union, as you mentioned, and we said at the beginning, uh, some public service media are under political pressure, including Polish television, uh, country where I come from. Uh, and of course, um, we are looking uh, at what's happening in different countries and the association or the alliance make different efforts to also help or support uh, members. And in extreme cases, these members are excluded, such as, for example, Belarus. Belarus. European Perspective Project, yes, uh, this is something that we are looking at, at more opening, maybe even to organization out outside public service media. For the moment, it started as a public service media. But to be very clear, the part which is public facing and the organizations participating in the project have to abide by the values. So uh, it is very, you know, uh, the, the, the Hungarian colleagues, if they would like to apply and be part of the European perspective, they would really have to tick off all the boxes that make a European perspective uh, fit. And uh, okay, thank you, Justine. Thank so you for the just precision. Just to be clear, just to be clear that it's not uh, only government public service media from uh, Hungary. Yeah, but it is it is, it is national public services. So this is uh, an issue. But you, you, we cannot put stamp on all the public service media. Of course uh, not. Of course not. But of course we need the, probably something better because uh, until we have national perspective and not one single European perspective that is born with that mission, I don't think we're ever going to get anywhere. I mean, Euronews, is, uh, it's a case uh, to prove uh, this point. I think that we have reached the end of our uh, panel. I mean, there are a lot of things uh, happening, a lot of things that are very interesting, but the main thing, the main purpose of this uh, workshop um, supported by the European Cultural Foundation is really to get the word out there and to let people know just this give me one more last remark maybe on that, because yeah. um, I, I wouldn't be happy if we end with the controversial about public service media, whether it's good or not. I think it's one of the quality um, sources for news and information that we talked about. And to build a European public sphere, which is really democratic and able to be resilient in the digital age, it's not able to do it with one actor or two actors. And that's why the Council, for, exa for, for example, is really advising or is, is asking for more participants from other sectors. And I'm very happy that the display group already is a very independent and very broad uh, cooperation. Um, um, we are working on, uh, maybe on uh, uh, working together with technology of the EBU as well. And we, we need a broader coalition of the willingness, uh, of, 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 the, of the people who are willing to build a European sphere and we should be open in technology and open for other partnerships. Okay, so you're all invited. <laughs> Make way, come up with ideas. It has to be something that comes as well from civil society and for, from professionals. But again, these are stepping stones and the virtue of all this project is that they're starting to put the issue of a European public sphere, which is trustworthy, 
and reliable and not based on advertising, so on commercial uh, spirit, but on public service spirit. This is happening and it regards the future of our society. Thank you very much for being with us. There's no time for discussion, no? No well, if you have to respect the, the, three, three minutes. Yeah. Yeah.